Please uh, take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter. 1 Samuel chapter. Uh, chapter 1. I wonder if there's anyone here today that has ever lent anything to anyone, or that's something small, something big. Sometimes the things we lend, we get back. Sometimes the things we lend, we never see again. Sometimes we're out in the community. Uh, people may ask us for some money, whether it's something small or something big. Back a few years back, when you make a phone call for a dime, maybe they've asked for a dime or a quarter to to get something or to buy a little pint of milk or something, or maybe they'll be asking for a dollar for a bus fare. These people are needy people, they, they, or they present themselves as needy people, and they want something. Sometimes we know people that need to borrow something, legitimate needs, and we lend it to them. They use it and they give it back. Today, in the passage we read this morning, we were learning about a lady by the name of Hannah, whose name means grace, who lent something very important to God, to the supreme creator of the universe. This lady lent something to God with the intent that he would abide and serve God forever. God had answered this lady's prayer. God had answered Hannah's prayer and gave her a very precious gift. The gift of a son. And God and God received this gift from Hannah. And Samuel served God continually from the time after he was weaned to the time he was dead, died. He served God continually in the tabernacle. Samuel, as you remember, he anointed two kings, Saul and David and it's because of a mother because of a mother that he was able to do what he did his mother did not keep him for herself she understood and she was grateful to have a son and so she gave the son back to God now how many things do we have that God has blessed us with that we are still keeping to ourselves. How many things? There may be nothing, but is there something that God wants us to give to Him? Each of us have different things that we can give to God. Each of us are in different phases of our life. But still, God wants you, God wants us to give Him things. God who created the entire universe in six solar days wants us to give him something. Not because he needs it, but he wants to see our sacrifice. He wants to see that we are going to be willing to give him something. Really, everything that we have belongs to God. We cannot name one thing that we have that should not be God's. It's likely there are some things in our life that don't belong in our life. Clearly they have to be removed completely. But God wants us to give those things that belong in our life, be willing to have, let him have control of everything. In the case of Hannah, she is giving to God, giving back to God, lending to God, the passage says, the scripture says, she is lending to God this son. You recall how the system worked in the Old Testament. We had the high priest who was from the tribe of Levi, who was from the family of Aaron. Eli was serving as the high priest at the time. And the high priest, we have the, the tabernacle was set up there in Jerusalem. And the before they went before they got there to Jerusalem, they went, went from place to place to place. 
40 different places through their 40 years of wandering, but the tabernacle was the place where God received the sacrifice. It was it's the place where people went three times a year to offer sacrifices to God. And as we learn in Sunday school today, prayer is the sacrifice of praise. There's all sorts of sacrifices that we can give to God. There's no longer a need for a physical animal sacrifice any longer because of what was done upon the Calvary's cross, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, God gave us His Son. God gave us His Son. So we would not have to spend an eternity separated from God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so we have here this lady by the name of Hannah, her husband, Athena, her adversary, Peniah, and we have this new little baby that's going to, that was born by the name of Samuel. Samuel's name means asked of God. Asked of God. And that's what, that's what Hannah did. She asked God for very specific requests. And God granted her request. Perhaps we fail many times in asking God for specific requests. Not all the time, but perhaps there are times when we fail and not asking for specific requests. Hannah's request was very specific. She wanted a son. And God provided her with a son. Her name means grace. And the whole principle that we have that's, that's, that's presented here in 1 Samuel in the early chapters is, is dealing with worship. As far as we see here that her husband, Elphina, is going to the tabernacle to worship. And in the process of going to the tabernacle and worshiping, Hannah realizes that she is missing something. She's missing a child. And children are very important. They're important today, and they were important in the days of Hannah. And so this was a very special prayer request that Hannah had. She had a prayer request for a, a, for a son, for a child, and God granted her request. So many times, people will forsake God. They will stop worshiping the Lord, and they will forsake God because there is an anger that they have with God. They're angry, they're upset with God for whatever reason. They don't understand perhaps what is happening to them or what's going on in their life, and so they are in rebellion with God. Hannah was trusting God. Hannah made a promise to the Lord that she would lend the child to the Lord. Now, too often, people are worshiping things that are made with their own hands rather than worshiping the one who has made their hand. That's a sad case in this society we live in today. It's a sad case. People do not want to give any regard whatsoever to God. They want to do what they want to do, and they want to disregard entirely what God says. They don't want to base what they do upon what the Word of God says. They want to base what they do upon what society says, what they think. And the world today is redefining everything the Bible-believing church stands for. They're in complete opposite with what this church stands for, with what the Word of God stands for. And we should base what we believe upon the Word of God. Everything we say, everything we do, must be based upon what the Scripture says. We must have scriptural support of what we do, and how we think, and how we behave. If we're heading in the wrong direction, we must look at what the Word of God says and head in the proper direction. So in verse 24, 1 Samuel, chapter 1, 
and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her. Now, Hannah was giving Samuel the essential nutrition that he needed for the first few years of his life. And when that, when she was no longer necessary to feed him, at that point in time is when she took him up to Jerusalem. She took him back. She was in Jerusalem. She was there in the tabernacle, praying and asking God to grant her petition. And she, after she had weaned him, it's a, a one time the action the, 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 she was no longer needed for his physical nutrition and so the action was fully completed she no longer Samuel no longer needed her for, for that phase of his life it was completely done when we think of the need for nutrition we have options of, of the physical nutrition our mothers, our parents, they made, made sure that we had the necessary nutrition that we needed when we were babies, when we were infants, when we were toddlers, all throughout our life, <coughs> until we were living on our own. They made sure to it, they were looking after us, in a physical sense, in a spiritual sense, in Second Peter chapter 2. Verse, verse 2 of 2 Peter chapter 2 as newborn babes desiring the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby we need the word of God if you want to grow spiritually you must have the word of God in your life you must be taking in the word of God just like if you want to survive physically we take food meats, vegetables, think of the food pyramid, all the different things in the food pyramid. Sometimes the pyramid's upside down, but nonetheless, we have some type of food that we eat physically. The same is true for our spiritual food. We must have the milk of the word, the sincere milk of the word, so we can grow spiritually. If you're not growing spiritually, it's possible you have an absence, absence of the Word of God in your life. We need more of the Word of God in our life rather than less of it. The Word of God we get on a Sunday morning is not adequate enough for us to survive spiritually, be able to grow spiritually. We need continually exposure to the Word of God. I'm not saying preaching every single day, but I'm saying sometime throughout the week, throughout the day, Take your Bible, open up a passage of the scripture, and begin to read it so that God can give you the understanding, God can give you the direction you must have in your life. See, Samuel, his mother, was caring for him physically, giving him that nutrition he needed, the direction he needed as an infant, as a helpless, innocent baby, until he no longer needed that nutrition, and she had weaned him. And so she took him up. She had a deliberate cause, she did. She took him up. She caused him to go up. She brought him with her up to Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem, as you know, it's over there in the Middle East. It's very hilly, very mountainous and so forth. It's over 2,500 feet above sea level, Jerusalem. Rama, there's, it's, it's lower than that. It's probably 400 feet plus or minus below that level. So she, they took him up she took him up to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, uh, and there is where the tabernacle was. There was where the tabernacle was set up. The tabernacle, with you have the holy place, the most holy place. Um, and also, when she went up to Jerusalem, she took other things with her. She took Samuel, perhaps her most precious possession, her little boy, her little son that God had given to her and she was going to give him back. She was going to lend him back to the Lord. And so she took, along with Samuel, she took the bullocks, three bullocks, 
bullocks were probably for a sacrifice. She took an ephah. An ephah is like, a, it ranges anywhere from um, it's a, a half bushel to bushel, or a third of a bushel of, uh, of, of grain. An ephah, a flower. And she took a bottle of wine. Now, I believe in this, uh, in this passage here, the bottle of wine is perhaps in, in the concentrated form of, of grape juice, unfermented grape juice. As you know, there was a, uh, a dispute back in 37, 38 about this very thing. Not necessarily here in this, this book of passage, but about wine. And I believe it was an unfermented, concentrated wine. And let me turn to 1 Samuel, pardon me, 2 Samuel 16, 1 for a moment. Next book over, 2 Samuel 16, 1, to try and give an idea of why it was, I believe, it was some type of concentrated form of, of uh, grape juice like we would have today. Um, when we buy some frozen grape juice, you know, you add water to it. You buy this little, little can of frozen grape juice, where you, 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 you dump it in a container, and you add water. If we look, look at 2 Samuel 16, for a moment, 2 Samuel 16 and verse 1. 2 Samuel 16. In verse one, you notice uh, what they're what they're taking here. What the David's taking in Second Samuel sixteen. And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled, and upon them two hundred loaves of bread, and hundred bunches of raisins, a hundred summer fruits, and a bottle of wine, and. Um, and the king said unto Ziba, What meanest thou this, these? And Ziba said, uh, The asses before the king's household to ride on, the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine that such be faint in the wilderness may drink. So we have here, the, this, these are for David's men. He's bringing this, this food. Ziba is for David's men. And he's noticing we have 200 loaves of bread, uh, 100 bunches of raisins, 100 summer fruits, and just one bottle of wine. It's not like the, the wine that people consume today, but I think it was possibly uh, some type of concentrated form of grape juice that was able to be, you add, you supplement with the water, because the water perhaps wasn't always the best in that territory at the time. And so the bottle of wine, she brought, a, she brought these things, the three bullocks, the ephah of flour, the three bullocks, the ephah of flour, and also the bottle of wine to along with her most prized possession, Samuel, her son, her firstborn son. And I think because of Hannah's willingness to express the fact that she was going to give him back, lend him back to the Lord, that's why God blessed her with other children. Later on in the book of Samuel, we learn about the other children uh, that she had. Now, as we remember... She remained there till he was weaned. And after the fact, that once he was weaned, she brought him up. She brought him up to uh, Jerusalem when he could, have, where he was supposed to abide forever. That was the intent. Just think how much help that was to Eli, particularly since Eli's sons had headed in the wrong direction. How sad that was. How Eli's own children. Did that which was evil and that which was wrong in the sight of the Lord. And we should never want to do that which was evil and which is wrong in the sight of the Lord. We should not be like the sons of Eli. We should be like Hannah, the willingness to give to the Lord and lend to the Lord. Have the willingness right to hold everything back for ourselves. We must be willing to give to the Lord what is His. And in reality, everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to the God. And so we have Hannah going up to Jerusalem, bringing with her her most important thing at all, of all is the son, Samuel. How hard that must have been. Perhaps Abraham understood or perhaps she understood how Abraham felt when Abraham was told to bring Isaac 
to sacrifice Isaac. It's all about having a willingness to obey, a willingness to do what God wants us to do. If we are running from God, if we're failure to want to have a proper obedience to God, then we are going to have some problems. But if we are willing to obey God and do what God says, then we will be blessed. What is it that you have that you can give to the Lord? What is it that you have that you can give to the Lord? You may not have a, a child, although we should dedicate our children to the Lord. We should dedicate ourselves to the Lord. We should be willing to let God do what He wants to do in our lives. We cannot want to hold on to things and try to control situations that we have no right to control. See, God is the sovereign. He is the one that is in control. He wants us as His children to be obedient to His will and His direction. That's why we, we need the milk of the Word. That's why we have to go back to the Bible, stick with the Bible, and study the Bible, read the Bible, and when possible, try to memorize the Bible. Or, or begin the process of discipline memorizing. Or having better exposure to the Scripture. Sometimes memorizing may take longer than we want it to take. But as long as we're reading the certain passages and trying to memorize them, or at least be familiar with them, those passages can mean a lot more to us than if we do not, do not study or do not read those passages. That's why we should try and systematically read through the Scripture, different parts of it, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, being willing to read through the Bible, start with the New Testament, start with the Gospel of John, but start someplace. Start with the book of Genesis, wherever you want to start. Start someplace, but be consistent. Because what what greater import is it than the Word of God, the what greater import does it have over the, uh, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Courier Post? Is the Word of God much more important than those newspapers? Certainly it is. Many, many magazines you can, the best magazine in the world, even if it's a, even if it's like a Christian magazine, but still, the Word of God should be read and studied before those other periodicals. Not that we can't learn things from the newspapers or from the Christian magazines, but God wants us to grow in grace. He wants us to be, be built up spiritually. And so, she, uh, he, she, with cause, deliberate cause, she went to the house of the Lord there in where the tabernacle was uh, was set up. And so in verse 25, we see that she slew a bullock. She brought three of them with her. She slew the bullock and brought the child to Eli. Now the importance of a bullock. In the Old Testament system, we have, it points to something. The sacrificial system was the point to something. It was the point to what was going to take place on Calvary's cross. A sacrifice the Lord Jesus Christ made for you, he made for me. We think of back in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, neither the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And then later on in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It's the blood of Christ. If you do not have the blood of Christ covering you, atoning for your sin, then you're still in Adam's sin. And you do not have the righteousness of Christ. See, back in the Old Testament time periods, back in the Old Testament time periods when Hannah was living, back when Samuel was living, we had to do this, the picture. 
the entire old ta the whole entire tabernacle. It's a picture of the heavenly tabernacle. It was to set up and to demonstrate the fact that man needed some type of blood sacrifice to cover, to atone for their sin. So Hannah brings this this bullock, and the bullock is sacrificed, but our bullock is killed. Now we're, we're no longer under the law, we have the ceremonial law, the civil law, the moral law. And we have we have a new covenant. We have the law of Christ. Christ wants us to be obedient to Him. Christ wants us to do what He wants us to do. See the Old Testament law. You know the Bible tells us we fall short of one thing. The Bible says, "For all sinned and come short of the glory of God." It was impossible to keep all the law. The law was a schoolmaster. It was to demonstrate something that could not be obtained, although people tried to, until Christ came. Christ came, and by his coming, by his death, his burial, and his resurrection, he has provided salvation to anyone who trusts in him, turns to him for salvation. There are people that are in their darkness. There are people that are in that are in sin today, that are for, that, that are separated from God. They're lost. They're, they remain dead in their trespasses and sin. You know, in the, the book of Romans, chapter six, Romans six fourteen. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law? But under grace, God forbid. All because we are not, we are under grace doesn't give us a license or the liberty to sin. But the point being, we are not under the law. Going back to where Hannah is living in her time period, she was under the law. It's a picture. The people of the Old Testament, those saints that lived in the Old Testament, look forward, look forward to. The cross. The prophets prophesied about the redemption, the Redeemer, the Messiah. And here the sacrifice that H Hannah was bringing. This bullock. She brought the sacrifice. She did it with cause. She brought him and a bullock was, was killed. And then she met Eli in verse 26. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. See, earlier on in the chapter, Eli was noticing this woman, Hannah, praying. She saw her. She thought she was, initially Eli thought she was intoxicated, but she wasn't. She was a woman of sorrowful heart, and she was pouring out her soul to the Lord and asking him for the specific request. And Eli gave her the assurance that God is going to answer your prayer. And God did. And now she has, a few years later, two or three years later, she has this encounter again with Eli. And she's coming back, praising the Lord and saying, I am the woman that stood by thee praying. You know, Eli, this Levite from the house of Aaron. And we have a we have a great high priest ourselves. Greater than greater than Eli. Eli again is from, from the house of Aaron, from the tribe of Levi, from the house of Aaron. But our high priest, our high priest back in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter Hebrews chapter nine, the Bible tells us that we have a greater high priest, not after the Aaronic priesthood, but after the order of Melchizedek, a priest who that never dies, never needs to be replaced. Hebrews 9, 9, 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second veil went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. 
the Holy Ghost, this signifying that he went into the holiest of all, and was not made manifest, well, as the first tabernacle, which was a figure for a time when the present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, and could not make him that did sacrifice perfect as pertaining to conscience. Hebrews 9, 6 uh, to 10. And the idea, the, the principle of a, a, a priest, you know, we have Hannah mentioned, as thy soul liveth, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee. You know, when we think of the idea of, of the personhood of people, Today, people want to discount and say we we just come from apes or whatever, whatever, whatever they say that we come from. You know, these little um, uh, these little ice worms, or I'm not sure what they say where they come from. But they, all these stupid things that scientists are saying. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say them the stupid things, but but they, they are ignorant scientists that don't, don't know better in the sense that they, there's things that they look at in the scientific community, in the scientific world, and they see they don't have an answer to. And the answer is found in, the, in believing the creative act of God in six days. And so the, the idea, the principle of, of having a living soul, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, you know, that man, Genesis, uh, Genesis 2, 7, you know, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. A living soul. So in, in, in Hannah says, as thy soul liveth, you know, each of us today, we are living souls. Body, we've got we try part right, body, soul, and spirit. There's both that material part and non-material part of, of us as human beings. And man became a living soul. And Hannah was telling Eli, not that he didn't know it, but she's as thy soul liveth. And he, she was he was re, she was rehearsing with him the fact, praising God, that she was the woman. Back several years back, that was was there in the temple praying and asking God for a son. And I'm sure Eli remembered her. She remembered her. Sometimes, when we don't know what to do in our life, when there's problems that we are facing and we become faint in what we're doing but the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in Luke chapter 18 verse 1 that we, we should pray and not faint we're not always to pray and not to faint when Hannah was, was faced with a, a concern in her life she prayed she asked a very specific request. She had a very specific request. She prayed. And so if you're faced with some type of conflict, some type of situation in your life, you must, like Hannah, pray. And you must, like Hannah, respond to God, to God by giving things, giving to, giving to God what He deserves, which He deserves everything. Hannah understood this. And Hannah was coming back. She was going up to Jerusalem with the child, with the sacrifice, and with some other things as well that she brought with her from her her uh, her home. And so she she identified herself as being the woman that was there. On a weekly basis, there's an opportunity to, to pray during the midweek service. And if you can't pray physically here, you can always pray someplace else. But we should be continually praying for the needs of our fellow saints, the spiritual battles that, that is, that's going on in, in the world, things that are things that are constantly, constantly coming around us. Just think of, of what God can give. You know, in, in Exodus chapter 16, you know, God gave bread. God gave, God gave the manna from heaven. Um, in Numbers chapter 27, probably Numbers 32, God gave 
land. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, you know, God gave a flock. And, you know, in, in Joshua chapter 6, you know, in Joshua chapter 11, God gave a city. God gave a territory there to Joshua, the victory. God is constantly giving things to us. The question is, are we aware of what he is giving to us? Are, are we aware of what God is giving to us? Every day, when we breathe, you know, think about the, how our body works. We may not understand it. And I don't, the, the medical community may not understand it either. But, but we think of how our body works. I mean, they, they understand some things. Don't get me wrong. I'm not completely opposed to them. But they understand some things. And they might understand more if they would acknowledge the fact that we, our bodies were created by the one true God. But our, our, we are fearfully and we are wonderfully made. Just, just think about how, 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 complex, how complex we are. And so, in verse 27, she says to Eli, For this child, and I could, she, Samuel's right nearby here, her, For this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petition. It's God that answers prayers. It's God that answers the petition of, of Hannah. It's God that will answer your petition. I'm not sure what petition you have today. It may be a child. It may be something other than a child. It doesn't have to be a child to, to apply this passion to your life. It could be anything. What is it you want God to give to you. What is it that God wants you to give back to Him? All for the purpose and serve all for the purpose and the big objective of serving Him and glorifying Him. What what we do in our lives has to and ought to glorify God. Whether it's receiving blessings from the Lord or giving things to the Lord for His honor and for His glory, everything must be done for Him and not for anything else. Sometimes we get all misdirected in our minds and we are doing things for ourselves or perhaps for other people. Maybe all noble and all good, but still, is God being glorified? To glorify God Are we glorifying God? Are we enjoying God's presence and His blessing in our lives? There are tons of distractions that are coming to your life from every angle. But we must not be distracted. Must keep focused and zoned in on what God wants you to do. God wants you to be obedient. In verse 28, Hannah, in her conversation with Eli, says, Therefore, a very important therefore, because of God's blessing, because God answered my request, therefore, also, I have lent him to the Lord. The creator, the all-sufficient one, the Lord, lent him to the Lord, the creator of the universe. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. So here, the entire life of Samuel, Hannah, brought him as a young young child, toddler, probably a toddler of some sort, and says, he is for the Lord's forever. He shall be lent to the Lord forever. And here's an interesting use of a pronoun here at the end of verse 28. And he worshipped the Lord there. See that, that personal pronoun, he? He worshipped the Lord there. And the antecedent of the pronoun he, I believe is Samuel. This young child who was lent to the Lord by his mother was properly instructed by her, who the creator of the universe is, who God was. 
and from infancy, perhaps even at the point of being even in prenatal form, he was told about God, about the God of Israel. It doesn't say that she was talking about God when she was pregnant. It doesn't say she was talking about God to him when she was raising him. But the very fact that he worshipped the Lord there indicates he knew what he was supposed to do. And so I believe that Hannah gave the proper instruction to her, her, to her son Samuel as far as who God is. And we today, in our lives, we must have a proper understanding of who God is. Of who God is. Everything around us should tell us there's a God. In nature, or even our own body functions, every single thing, every discipline of science, every discipline down there at the university that can teach, it should all come back to the fact that there's a God that exists, and a God who had a plan for us, and a God who became flesh for us. When the fullness of time was come, God sent for the Son, made of a man, made of a law, for the purpose of coming back to redeem us because of that, that sin of Adam, who was there in Eden, that acted on our behalf. We were there with Adam when he sinned. We never partook of that forbidden fruit. But then we think of the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of one man's sin, death passed upon all, but by the obedience of one, the Lord Jesus Christ, we could all have opportunity, those who put our trust in him, to, re to be redeemed and to be saved and to be delivered from the destiny of destruction, the miseries of hell, which was a place that's created for the devil and his angels. It's a place that we should not want to go to, and that's why we have redemption. We have the Incarnation. Very, very important time period in history. The fullness of time, the Incarnation. A very special woman, God chose, Mary, to give birth to the sinless Son of God who was impeccable. And we have an opportunity for that Son, the Son of God, the Creator of the universe, we were talking in science class how, how expansive this universe is. And just think, God became a man. Just think if a man becomes a, a little fly, even smaller than that, it must be something very insignificant. But he came, became a man because he wanted to provide salvation for us. And then 33 years after his birth, he died upon a cross for you, for me, for everybody out here in this world. And that salvation is something that's bona fide for everyone who turns to Christ. Trust him for salvation. And he's worthy of our worship. If we've been redeemed today, we must worship him. Samuel, in verse 28, and he worshiped the Lord there. A very tremendous thing that Hannah gave to the to the Lord, a little child. A little child. And we as Christians today are benefiting from what the ministry Samuel had. If Hannah was selfish and withheld the son from the Lord, of course this is all hypothetical. We, we do not know how biblical events would be different. God would have raised some, up somebody else, but we wouldn't have the book of Samuel perhaps, not in its present format. There would be many things we wouldn't have. And failure to obey God changes things in your life and the lives of others. Hannah was obedient. She took the proper course. 
And God wants you to be obedient and to take the proper course as well. His disobedience is going to lead to disappointment. So please, this morning, as we reflect upon this passage, upon the life of Samuel, the life of Hannah, think about what God wants you to do. What is it that God wants you to give to Him? It's something different for each of us. What is it we must put off? What is it that we must put on? We cannot be living in rebellion against God. But continue on to do what is right. To look into His Scripture, look into the Word of God for direction, for encouragement. Find some other fellow believer to encourage, to build up, to exhort edify we are functioning as a body and if my foot doesn't want to do something it's going to influence the rest of my body we can go through every single part of the, the body the physical body and talk about how they influence everybody else as far as my physical body here we are the body of Christ and God wants us to function properly. God wants us to do what pleases Him. And not what pleases ourselves. Take an example from Hannah. No matter what, what phase of the Christian life we're in, we have to understand that God wants us to be obedient and be dedicated to Him. We each have different experiences. Different things lie ahead of us. Sometimes some things we know about what's coming. We don't know what we don't know what else is coming. Some in other, in other cases, but still, we have to be ready and willing to be obedient, just like Hannah was obedient to God for the great gift that she gave that He gave to her. She lent Him to the Lord. And we see at the end of verse 28, he worshipped the Lord there. Father, thank you for thy word. Allow us to be willing to worship thee where we're at. Help us to find thee in the scripture. I want to thank thee for the salvation that thou hast provided for us. Give us that direction that we must have. Encourage us with the scripture. Uh, we do ask that you would allow us to be able to put off those things that thou hast put off that are hindering us from running the race. And we'll put on those things that are going to assist us and to glorify thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Allow us to run the race with patience, to look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We do ask that thou would Build us up with the Word of God. Cause us not to deviate from doing what is right. But allow us to do what is honoring to Thee. We do ask that we convict us of our sin. Demonstrate to us through Thy Word uh, those things that we must meditate upon. We do ask that the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified in all we say and all we do and all we think, in whose name we pray, amen. Please uh, take your hymnal, and let's stand and we'll sing uh, hymn uh, 278, hymn 278.